Put us down, Jenna. The Dirty Dozen in space. The Magnificent Seven in space. Robin Hood in space. The comparisons are thrown out to analyse this British science fiction series which ran for four seasons between 1978 and 1981. While it's referred to as cult TV, it's easy to forget that shows like this which became cults were regularly pulling in 10 million viewers every week which by today's standards would be a massive mainstream hit. Anyway, just to clarify, from the beginning, let's get it out there. Blake Seven was shite. Down and save. Roughly half of its 52 episodes were awful. Its effects budget was £45 per episode. Its alien environments were either abandoned steelworks or Welsh quarries. And I wouldn't expect anyone born after 1990 to last more than 10 minutes of it. But if you're prepared to persevere and you can handle the aesthetic, it was also unique, with consistently top-notch performances, irresistible character dynamics, and I believe ideal for a modern remake. And in this video, I'm going to outline the main reasons why so. Lucky you. In a dystopia where the fashion police are evidently defunded, company man Rog Blake, played by Welshman Gareth Thomas, learns that his memory has been suppressed by the fascistic federation and that he is in fact a revolutionary freedom fighter. Think Jason Bourne, Che Guevara and a bit of Benny from Crossroads. On a prison ship bound for a penal colony, Blake's revolution begins to take shape as he enlists a bunch of thieves, smugglers and killers to help him overthrow the vessel. Do you know how those door panels work? No, not that time. It's simple enough. All authorised personnel have their palm prints filed in the computer. Blake Kerr-Avon. When it comes to computers, he's the number two man in all the federated worlds. Who's number one? The guy who caught him. In episode two, they just happen to have a chance encounter with an abandoned alien spaceship, which also just happens to be the quickest and most advanced ship in the galaxy. I don't believe it. With a ship like this and a full crew, then we can start fighting back. Or maybe it's the universe, not the galaxy, or wherever. It's never specific about galactical location stuff, and in that way, similar to Joss Whedon's Firefly. But whereas Mal Reynolds was a reluctant hero, Blake is very much the romantic idealist out to bring out freedom and justice to all, and all too willing to risk the lives of his mates for a chance of realising it. At least you're still alive. Not until power is back with the honest man. Have you ever met an honest man? Blake Seven was all about the characters and their often conflicting external desires and personalities. It's time we really hurt the Federation. Oh, we've been hitting at the fingers, the arms. I want to hit at the heart. And the heart of the Federation is Earth. Where exactly, or do you plan to take the whole planet? The crew were not exactly good guys. This moral conflict is most embodied by Blake and who was effectively his second officer, computer expert and embezzler Kerr Avon. Show me someone who believes in anything, and I will show you a fool. We are not going to use Star One to rule the Federation. We are going to destroy it. I never doubted that. I never doubted your fanaticism. This is maybe my favourite character in the history of TV. Played with cold-blooded charm, cynicism and comic timing, by Paul Darrow. He's like Bond, Blackadder and the Sheriff of Nottingham, all rolled into one sarky, sexy bastard. Listen to me. Wealth is the only reality, and the only way to obtain wealth is to take it away from somebody else. Wake up, Blake. I presume you have no tedious scruples about cheating and lying. None at all. Oh, good. One of these days, they are going to leave you. They were almost ready to do so this time. Yes, I thought they might be. You handle them very skillfully. I do. You've made your impression you can sit down now. What does that mean? 
She knows that you're very brave. Now sit down. I used to say to people, I bet Avon's got a friend somewhere in the galaxy. And you were right. That must be a novel experience for you. This is my ship. Avon becomes the main man from season three onwards as the show took the unusual step of losing its titular character. Now, talking of remakes, the brilliance of Darrow would make recasting quite intimidating, but there's so much to take forward with the template that Darrow provided for Avon, plus his dynamics with the story and the characters, I think it's surpassed any ambitious actor would relish in the modern age. Now, we also have Villa, an abject coward and genius of a thief, and the gentle giant murderer Gan, who dies early in season two. In season three, an ex-Federation pilot, Del Tarrant, joins the team. Modelled on Han Solo, but let's face it, without a lot of the humour and charm. Now, talking of modern takes, what we have to do is talk about the women of Blake 7. Okay, yes, they all happen to be hot, but very capable. First of all, Jenna, a smuggler and pilot who wants to nail Blake basically, but you're never quite sure if she can be trusted. The alien telepath, Callie, who's like a badass Deanna Troy, Dana Mellenby, the vengeful young weapons expert, and Sulin, the mercenary gunslinger of off-the-scale heat. But let's talk about the big one. President of the Terran Federation, manipulative, evil, power mad, possibly the hottest bitch ever to wear a buzz cut, Supreme Commander Servalan. I don't know what it is about this bastard, but she might just be the sexiest woman in space, and for me, the most regular purveyor of childhood wood. In our modern entertainment world, where women are being inappropriately, I would say, shoehorned into action franchises and patting themselves on the back for it, Blake 7 is surely an example of how to do it. These chicks are scrappers with purpose and agendas. As well as the main cast, there's a regular stream of one-off women characters as politicians, scientists, lawyers, assassins, commanders, and guerrilla fighters. I never thought twice about this as a kid, and it simply made for better TV, especially as it wasn't then constantly having labels slapped on it. She's very good. Promising. Quite promising. Blake 7 was at its best when it stuck to its central premise, a band of disparate outlaws on the run fighting a corrupt and all-powerful empire. One of the weak points in this series was world building. It occasionally tried to veer into alien or monster territory, and more often than not, when this was tried, it was a dismal, perhaps even a laughable mess. But when it stuck to its guns, it was able to explore imperialism, insurrection, corruption, surveillance, germ warfare, idealism, resistance, heroism, avarice, and sex. These had power, relevance, and gave chance for these complex characters to clash and the actors to shine, particularly, of course, Darrow, Jacqueline Pierce, and Gareth Thomas, who often gracefully walked all those lines between heroism, self-interest, and pure vanity. I think I can destroy it. And again, there's so much unmined potential for these characters and this whole world to take inspiration from in the 21st century. And crucially, it's the right genre setting and audience for it. Now, modern shows, they like to tie up all their story threads, don't they? So we can't finish without talking about the Blake 7 Series 4 finale. The best ending in the history of TV simple as. You won't find any neat story contrivances here, and looking back at that from the year 2022, that was refreshing. It's ripe for the remake picking, an adult show with adult themes and applicable to our modern anxieties. This could be the British escapist show that we really deserve. I say Bring back Blake 7. Until then, bring, bring us up, Kelly.
One last thing, Supreme Commander. I must tell you this. You are undoubtedly the sexiest officer I have ever known. Goodbye, Servalan. Thank you.